All right, this is going to be the last in this series of three on uh, the education system and what's going on in Taiwan with their third world uh, legal system. You know, the premier of Taiwan said within the last few weeks that he wants to push, push, push to get Taiwan to have English as the second legal language. That is an absolute joke unless Taiwan's going to address the problems that I'm describing in these three episodes. It is an absolute utter joke for Taiwan to try to make English a second legal language when they make normal English teaching a black market like I explained in the last video. Without the ESL teacher license. That's a no-brainer. That should have been done 20 years ago. And without having done that 20 years ago, this is a joke. It is a disgrace and it is a joke. And it's, and it's not even a partisan issue. This is the thing. America's immigration problems are as stupid as this. But it's got American issues going on. I don't know specifically what they are. I'd have to ask Mexicans. I get, I get people ask why I write these, these English teaching books. It's because I'm not allowed to help Taiwanese learn English. They have to learn English. There, as I'm going to talk about today, there are government requirements concerning English. All right. First thing I'm going to explain. I talked about this in another video, but I don't think I explained it very well. So, humor me if you've, if you've, heard this before. If you don't understand phonetics, I talk about it in, in, the, in the video over at write.pink, the website. I've got a video there where I give an introduction to these, this read with dot series. And in the beginning of that, I go through the phonetic alphabet briefly. This here, this KK and this DJ, these here are phonetic alphabet letters. And basically what's going on here, humor me and follow me with this. This is part of the third world legal system that's going on in Taiwan. Here we've got, it says KK here and it says DJ here. And then KK says, we're looking at screenshots from a, from a, a dictionary, from an Android app dictionary. We've got two side-by-side -side screenshots. It's called Dr. I. It's a great dictionary. I've, I've, had it on several of my phones because I buy a, an HTC phone in Taiwan and it comes installed on the phone. It's very useful, especially for Taiwanese. I use Hanping because it's better going back and forth both ways between English and Chinese. But this is called Dr. I and it's very, very useful for Taiwanese. They need to learn English and this helps them. So here in the dictionary, right at the top, before the definition, it's got two pronunciations, KK and DJ. Now, both of these pronunciations are British. And in fact, if you look up a word online and you ask for the British and American pronunciation, you're going to get this. You're going to get these. Now, this first one, I'm going to change this, transliterate. I'm going to change this into English phonetic letters, how we would learn in America, how, how a kindergartner or first grader might see these, probably first grader. The KK here says to pronounce this. Bear. Bear. With a short E. Now the DJ here, the word is bear, like rawr, you know, you know, going on a bear hunt, you know. Okay, we got a bear. So the DJ here says to pronounce it Bah. Be. So the first is B short E R. Bear. Now we never teach that pronunciation in English. It's in America. It's weird. And we've got B. The second is B. 
because it's a little miniature uh at the end and all of the phonetics professors with their PhDs and half sawed off glasses sit together and say, I hear a very small short U sound at the end of that. It sounds like an uh, uh. So we're going to write that letter in there also. It's a be, a be. So, you know, that's why they've got the letters that they do. Now, American pronunciation, we'd say bear. Be, it should be a long A sound. Bear. 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 Maybe bear short A. Maybe. But it should be bear. B-A-R bear. I think in another video I said it's bear, but I went and looked it up because I've got a book about this. So that's, that's U.S. pronunciation. That, that, that's USA. Now I'm going to look at this other word, city. City. KK says to pronounce this word, city. I'm going to write here what, what that would look like to a first grader. C, short I, T, short I. C, T. It's a city. The city. Now, the DJ pronunciation, there's two pronunciations. One's labeled KK, one's labeled DJ. The DJ pronunciation, also British, C, T. C T, you know, double E long, double E long. That's how they would say to pronounce it. Now, the American pronunciation, USAM right over here, how we learn, pronouncing it phonetic, phonetic sounds here, it'd be C T. That's how we're supposed to pronounce it, C T. So on the one hand here, we've got C T, two short I's, and then C T, two long E's. That's how the phonetic alphabet says you're supposed to pronounce it. Here's the problem with this. These are two different British pronunciations. Now, I've had a pretty good go at British accents. I've, I've placed a guy in, in Northern Ireland rather than Southern. I placed a guy from Manchester in his childhood. Um, I placed people from Birmingham. I placed people from outside of London. And I've, I've spoken in the British accent and made the British guy blush because it, it's almost embarrassing that a Yank would have a better British accent than I would. Of course, I haven't been to England for seven years, but it is a bit embarrassing. I've, I've had that. Uh, my good buddy Noah Moss was there when it happened. I'm not an expert, but I'm not a novice. My opinion, the KK is how they pronounce it in Wales. I only heard people talk that weird way from Wales. Everywhere else, not Scotland or Ireland. Uh, I say that would be a bit different of an accent. Um, actually, that was a bit more of a, that was a more London Cockney. I'm sorry. Um, no, I'm not going to do accents in this episode. I'm not. It's a tough luck. I'll, I'll do British accents somewhere else. Maybe when I'm gone, Mark sits in for me, and we'll, you will get we'll get that. So, KK the city. It's it's the bear a bear. I've only heard that. Now, listen, if you're going to do an ER, just for your curiosity, if you're going to do an ER, er, like an er sound, in the phonetic phonetic alphabet, not English, phonetic alphabet, it would be written like this, an upside down R, er, like, like um, burr or sure, maybe, maybe, something like that would be E, an upside down R, or they have this... Um, I don't know. It's like this little weird, there's this, um, they, they, they have these weird little phonetic characters that do weird things. So none of this, you know, just by contrast, if you're curious what the phonetic alphabet would be. Okay. I just drew some weird looking letters. If you're listening on the podcast, it's not a big deal. The KK sounds like whales. The DJ sounds like kind of close to the rest of Britain minus the Irelands and Scotland. But it also sounds similar to how they'd say it in Australia or uh, Canada or uh, New Zealand. Um, not, you know, slightly different accents, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a CT or it's a, it's a bear, you know, it, dropping the R's, that French influence from old Europe. 
KK is Wales. It's not normal British. That's my experience. Even if it's not Wales, it's not normal. Here's the problem with this. From, from the Ministry of Education, which I talked about in the last video, Taiwan is supposed to teach and test based on American English spelling and pronunciation. They're supposed to, children are supposed to learn to pronounce it the American way, not the British way, spell it the American way, not the British way. They call it Mayu, American English, as opposed to Yu, which is British English. En underscore US, not En underscore UK. That's what they're supposed to learn. But, <laughs> you see this little spelling here, this little, this, you know, the, the KK spelling, the S, the, the little capital I there is an iota. It has a short I sound. It's from Greek is what it's all about. And then the two I's, those are supposed to say E. And then that little goofy looking three thing for the bear, that's, a, that's an epsilon from Greek. It's a short E sound, E. Eh. The upside down E there is, I believe, called a schwa. And that, that's just like a uh, sound. It's a uh, um, because we do that a lot in our words. Uh. They're supposed to memorize that phonetic alphabet spelling and they're supposed to match it with either multiple choice or fill in the blank some objective test on the Taiwan government English test called the GEPT. They've got some Chinese name for it. The government English test in Taiwan, the GEPT, they're supposed to recite and remember the phonetic alphabet spelling for Wales pronunciation, not most British, you know, Australian, Canadian, what I would, what it sounds like to me anyway, but what I've only heard in Wales, not normal British English, phonetic spelling, phonetic alphabet, after spending 10 years learning, maybe seven years, learning American pronunciation and spelling. And when they, ha as if that's not crazy enough, I mean, did you have to write the phonetic alphabet for your, no, of course you didn't. You know, when, when you're learning English as a kid in, in America, in the West, in Britain, even in Britain, did you have to produ produce it? No, you didn't. You have to produce, I mean, this assumes that you know the, the phonetic alphabet. And that's the other thing. They don't have a test on seeing phonetic letters and having to pronounce them correctly. There is no test for the Taiwanese kids to see if they know what the flop in seven heavens and eight hells or whatever there are, these letters are supposed to even say. There's nothing for that. You just have to memorize the phonetic alphabet letters and we don't use the phonetic alphabet in America. That's a British thing. Now, it's useful for ESL. You know, I was at the Moody Bible Institute and missionaries love to study other languages. And so missionaries love, you know, the phonetic alphabet. And so I remember pulling the ESL textbooks out of the library and studying the phonetic alphabet while I was at Moody. Yes, I, you know, some interested people and weirdos like me would study that. I was using chopsticks, uh, you know, for 10 years before I ever came to Taiwan. So, uh, you know, we've got weirdos that like to study phonetic alphabet, but it's not a normal thing. So they are supposed, they're required to learn American spelling and pronunciation by the government education requirements. And for the test, they're supposed to spell it. American spelling on the, on the GEPT. They're supposed to pronounce it if they have any oral tests, you know, according to American pronunciation. And then they're supposed to produce this less common of the two British phonetic spellings here in their dictionaries. This is a Taiwanese dictionary screenshot you're looking at. And, and the dictionary is great. The dictionary does it correctly. This is what the government expects. I've seen little handheld paper dictionaries. They have the same two right there, KK and DJ. They're supposed to take the British phonetic alphabet spelling and put those letters to match it with the correct word. And there's no test as to whether or not they even know how to pronounce those letters correctly. Why? Because of the crazy education test obsessed culture, like I explained previously. Now, I'm going to explain the other big problem with English testing, where they, where they don't understand stuff that's going on in Taiwan. I'll explain the other big problem. 
So I'm, I'm drawing this, if you're listening on the podcast, stroke order in Taiwan goes f- across first and then down. Uh, that's how to write Chinese characters. I'm going to go through this quickly. If you've heard this before, I, I can almost feel Zach complaining. I already heard this. Listen to this, Zach. This has been my life for 10 years. As, as irritating as this is to listen to, I've had to put up with 10 years of this in a country that I'm trying to help, to befriend. And this country, Taiwan wants free trade with America. And they're not even willing to get their own English teaching in order. We need to talk about this every day, 10 times in America. How dare Taiwan ask for free trade when they're not getting this in order and the Americans, the English teachers have been telling them for years, they've been here talking about it. We, we, love, we, we love Taiwan. We really believe they're good people trying to do what's, what's right. But we need to be honest about what's going on. That's what this is. I'm not, I'm not saying, no, get rid of Taiwan. Don't give them free trade. That's not what I'm saying. I hope, I hope they clean this up this week and that Taiwan has free trade this week. That's what I hope for. I really hope for that. Um, all right. I've got my microphone in my way of my pen here, so I'm going to continue talking this way. Uh, we've got my little spit screen here showing up on my screen. So, in Taiwan, they write across first and then down. That's how Chinese characters are written. This means 10. It looks like a plus. It means 10. Uh, I'm going to draw here a symbol for uh, a, a tree. That's a tree. Now, in English, we, we write down first and then we go across. So a plus would be written down first and across. Same with a T. Here's why. When they write their characters, they're given a box with a dotted cross in the middle, making it into four quadrants. That's a box they practice writing. They practice writing their numbers in a box with four quadrants, not in a line, by the way, the, 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 Rome, the, 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 the Arabic numbers. In, in, a, in English, when we learn to write, we've got something that looks like a road. It's got a top line, it's got a baseline, and it's got a dotted line in the middle called the X height, if you're into fonts and stuff. Now, when, we, when they write, they need to establish halfway the midpoint, so they're going to write their line going halfway across first, and that helps them establish halfway in the box, and then they write you know, whatever their other characters are. So if we're writing a character for a tree, they're going to go up in the top quadrant, the, the, the centers of the top two boxes, and then they're going to draw their tree, and they're going to do that. It makes sense in their system to draw their letters across first. It makes sense. In the American system, we've got this road. So we go from the top line, we go down to the bottom line, and now we've got our own miniature box. You got, you got the line on top, you got the line on bottom, dotted line in the middle. You draw the stem first, the L, the K, the H, you draw the back first, and then now you've got kind of a miniature box to work with. So then we can cross it and make it a T, or we can uh, add the rest of the fun and make it a K you know, or uh, make an H, you know, that's, that's how we do things. Or we can make a T. Now, here's, here's why stroke order, and in America, we learn to do it this way, you do it and you're done. We don't really care about stroke order. We really don't care. But here's why it matters. If you write a T quickly, you'll write it down, you'll come up, and then you, your pen might keep touching the paper, and you go up, and you write something that looks sort of like that. If you wrote a, a wrote lowercase t without picking up your pen, if you don't put a tail on your t, then you might write it looking like that. It might look like kind of a plus sign. If you don't pick up your pen or you're sloppy with it, you're going to add these extra lines from how we normally learn to write it in school, and then everybody knows what you were trying to write. They'll say, oh, well, when I make that mistake, I'm trying to write a t, and you recognize it. Well, in Taiwan, if they were to write a T with the Taiwanese, the, the Chinese Mandarin, uh, Chinese character stroke order, and they didn't pick up the pen off the paper, it would look like this, like kind of a weird cursive lowercase e. And you would have no idea they're trying to write a T. That looks like an E. Well, here's the thing. 
They teach in school to write English letters with the Chinese stroke order. I'm going to show you this to show how absurd it is. They cross the T first and then they draw the stem. And they cross the capital T first and then draw the line that goes down. This is how they draw an I. That's gong, that's the word for working. This this a capital T character is is a C, it's a C, and that's actually part of Xi Jinping's uh, family name. The C is like a cap the phonetic letter for Chinese President Xi's family name C ha it looks like a capital T in Taiwanese phonetics. And th I mean, this is this is how in E they would write, you know, all the th horizontal lines first and then the vertical. I, I, they write a J across first and then they go down. They dot the I before they draw. They dot the J before they draw it. Now it shouldn't really matter, but when it comes to cursive, you need to cross it last, and you need to know how to cross it after the fact, not before. So. Then again, you have writing very quickly. Okay, why is this? Why is this matter? Because at the end of the school year, elementary school students are required to stand up in front of the classroom and write the English letter the wrong way by the Chinese stroke order, not how we learn to write the English letters. They're supposed to write it by the Chinese stroke order, as if it matters first of all, and if they don't, then they fail the test. And Taiwanese children have all this time and effort and energy that goes into studying the weird way of writing the letters. Now, if I write my Chinese characters the wrong way, I'll give you an example. This, this here is a box, and I'm drawing it with proper stroke order, kind of. That's a box. It's a mouth. It's called, it means it's a mouth. Now, if I were to draw it semi-properly with a paintbrush, I'd kind of come down at a small angle here, and then I'd come up, and I'd do a doohickey, and I'd come down, and I'd go across like that. And it would kind of be at angles like that. The bottom part would stick out like a little miniature foot, maybe. That's what it would look like. Now, if I wrote that really, really fast, then it would look like this. And that's actually the correct, it kind of looks like a number two, uh, like a scrunch down squash two. That's actually the cursive in Chinese, the cursive version of that. Now, as an American, I would want to draw this. Just I'd just go around like a box like that. Now, if I drew that fast, I just end up making a circle, and that looks like a zero in Chinese. Kind of, it's an unofficial zero, a Ling. Um, they wouldn't know what I was trying to write. They think I was trying to write zero if I wrote it wrong. If I wrote their stroke order wrong, they would laugh at me. Even if even if I don't get it right, they la they would laugh if your stroke order is wrong. It looks funny to them, and they don't know what you wrote. Even though it looks like it, they don't know what you wrote if you get the stroke order wrong. But they teach our stroke order wrong. Uh, and, you know, this kind of goes back to Chinese culture thinking that they are the center of the universe. Like they would like they would think that Chinese invented English. Like. That's how they act. And, you know, Americans would think that they invented everything. You know, we, we have the same narcissism for our own culture. So there, there you have culture-wide narcissism. Maybe, maybe there are two, three personality disorders from cluster B after all, because narcissism is one of those in cluster B. Look, Taiwan needs desperately to get their understanding and their teaching methods for English sorted out. And it needs American help. Now, I'm not going to keep talking about this again and again and again in future episodes, but I'm going to refer back to this. Taiwan wants free trade with America. And Taiwan says that they have a goal of making English a legal language. <clears throat> they're very inviting to Americans. They, they're really warm and friendly. The airports are uber friendly, super, super kind and, you know, Welcome to Taiwan. We hope your stay here is wonderful. Super, super, super nice. But then you run into this stuff after you show up. And a lot of Americans, look around, Google for it, search, ask. You know, there's a lot of brokenhearted Americans. But then again, Taiwan's a very delightful place in many ways. It's really a yay boo. And it's much more yay than boo, or I wouldn't still be over in Asia. But this 
you know, Taiwan, this country wants to have free trade with America on, on, par, on, on raw materials supplied by China. And they want to have um, English as, as this official language. They want to have this strong friendship with America. And it's a big deal. Taiwan made an application to, uh, for, for free trade to be exempt from, from the tariffs. And when, when it was just rejected, you, you know, the process application review, then rejected. When it was rejected, it made headlines in Taiwan. Well, we got our papers back. Our application was rejected. And they really, really want free trade with America, but they're not willing to take obvious steps. They know about this. They've been told. They have been told. But we're dealing with personality disorder style inability to change. Taiwan has never known fundamental change. It happens at a snail's race pace. Even the Taiwanese have given up on, on ever being able to get these things changed. And they also need to have Americans in Taiwan if, if they're going to uh, hope to become strong. So what can Taiwan offer America? in exchange for free trade, they could become a strong country. And that means good English, which means not having these problems that I've been talking about. And it's very easy and e it's very easy, clear to get rid of. Very, very easy. They need to take the KK test out of their, their English test. They need to stop having children stand up in front of the classroom uh, to, to, to write the, the stroke order in English. And they need to teach the correct stroke order. Um, and they need to get an ESL teacher license. Now, here's where I, here's where I get into my little soapbox. America, or America, Taiwan needs Americans in Taiwan badly. America needs Taiwan to be strong. For Taiwan to be strong, they need more Americans in Taiwan. They need this. There have been Americans that have put up with this stuff in Taiwan They've survived. They put up with it for a long, 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 long time. And with this third world legal system, and I, I want you to understand this because I want you to support free trade with Taiwan. That's, that's what I'm going at with this. And I want you to call your congressman. The numbers in the phone book. Call and say, I want a strong Taiwan. I want a first world Taiwan. Call Congress and support a first world Taiwan. Say, I want a first world Taiwan. And refer, say, Jesse Steele from Michigan's fourth district has talked to his congressman. And they'll know. I want a first world Taiwan. I talked about an American who left Taiwan after a few years, because he, he couldn't learn in, in university. I wish that he had stayed, but he gave up. I believe that any American since 2002, who's been in Taiwan more than half of a year for any five separate years, should be able to get a free three-year visa and do any work that relates to international work. There are many Americans who would qualify for that. And no, no longer in the future, only in the past. And that cleans up for Americans. That rewards any Americans who've tolerated Taiwan's third world legal system and their terrible, uh, laughable English teaching. How, however long they've been, that counts. For like my friend who only has two or three years, he can finish his five years on an ESL teacher license. And they should get a special resident visa. It's good for three years and they can only do work that relates to uh, international work. They, they, they cannot do blue collar work. They may not. They may not take Taiwanese jobs away. See, one of the, one of the reasons I explained in the other video about the, the visa requirements, 14 hours, those are all protectionist laws because they don't want foreigners to take away Taiwanese jobs. But teaching English 
and doing graphic design in English and doing marketing in English are not jobs Taiwanese can have by definition. They require native English speakers. You have to have an American passport and not be Taiwanese. If you have a Taiwanese passport, but you grew up in America, then you get the lower pay and you're regarded a Taiwanese employee. It, it must be a foreigner's job by definition. So those, those protectionist laws shouldn't apply, but they apply them. This is like duh, no brainer stuff. How many protectionist laws in America apply that shouldn't? What about allowing Mexicans legally to go into America to teach Spanish? Why don't we, why, why are Americans teaching Spanish in American schools? Why are Americans allowed to teach Spanish? Now, I had a Spanish teacher, awesome lady, Barb Dinowitz, love you. Um, you know, she, she had very excellent Spanish. So, I mean, that was great. But technically, she should have been teaching art, not Spanish. Why, why are Americans allowed to teach Spanish? at schools in America. We've got so many Mexicans. We've got so many qualified Mexicans who should be talking about a good, happy Mexico in America. If, if a Mexican qualified, and I think it should be a Mexican. They're the country that we're related to that we want friendship. We should not be from Spain. We love, we love Spain, but Mexico is the country next to America. If someone has a, a college degree from Mexico and, um, and they understand good English, they need to know English. They should be teaching Spanish at America's schools. Um, and they need to be Mexican. They need to be, and they need to have a license. And you have a license. And they should have private tutoring, like, like people do piano lessons. And, and, and um, you know, maybe, uh, I suppose, well, it's pretty funny, friends, it's like piano lessons. And guitar, piano, guitar, drum lessons. They should be able to have a Spanish lessons. So Mexicans should be able to get a, a Spanish teaching license and teach that, you know, in America. And likewise, Taiwan should have an ESL teacher license. And I call this a USARC program. There are some jobs that protectionist laws can't protect because only a foreigner can do them. And it's not working in the kitchen, Carl Rove. It's teaching Spanish in America and it's teaching English in Taiwan. I believe that what Taiwan can do, and I want you to agree with me on this. I'm, I'm trying to persuade you. <laughs> I'm going to be upfront with my point. As I explained in, in my, um, in the, 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 um, it was the, the prerequisite one that the, the, the symposium prerequisite video. I want you to support a USARC program in exchange for Taiwan having free trade with America, even in uh, raw materials and parts, components, parts supplied and assembled uh, from China but assembled in Taiwan. Quality control check in Taiwan, that would probably improve quality a lot. Poss possibly quality control check, possibly. May may maybe like half tariffs or like, you know, lower, lower tariffs if it's a quality control tech done in, check done in Taiwan. If Taiwan's willing to reward those Americans, any American who's been deported from Taiwan unless they committed a, a, a misdemeanor offense, no, nothing related to immigration law, except for as long as they're in the country legally, did not enter, did not overstay. Well, you know, even overstaying, I think overstay should be forgiven. I've never overstayed my visa in Taiwan. I'm very proud about that. I worked very hard for that. I do not, I don't identify with being, entering a country legally or with overstaying. I worked very hard, very hard. And I, I think that I need to be rewarded by Taiwan for that. There's no thanks. They want all this. They want to take, 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 but they don't want to clean up their third world legal system that like makes life miserable, absolutely miserable for Americans in Taiwan. They need Americans. They love America. They want us to give them free trade from parts supplied by China, but they've got to have some give where it matters and they've got to clean up their third world legal system and they can do it by enforcing stop signs as I've talked about and they can do it with allowing Americans to have uh, a three-year residency called a USARC and by getting a teacher's license. And if someone's, anyone who's been in Taiwan five years in the last, uh, since 2002, should be able to qualify. And if it's been less than that, then they should get the ESL teacher's license to finish their years. And I ask you to call your congressman, write your congressman, find the website, send an email. So you support USARC program 
and that you support a first world Taiwan. And, and I mean, think about it. If Taiwan were to, were, to, were to extend that friendship to America, don't you think that they should get an exclusive franchise on being able to import Chinese products into America by way of Taiwan? Don't you think that would also have different ramifications for global peace? Think about that.